presentation will really take two parts. One will be the first uh, 10 minutes or so, which I will take covering the context in which sport uh, engages in society, the role that it plays in society, certainly around questions of vulnerability. And then the second half of it will be covered by my colleague, uh, Dr. Lynette Hughes from Northern Ireland Association for Mental Health, who speaks specifically about the issue of uh, sport and how it helps to address uh, issues that may arise in that area. So um, sport, as we probably already know, is an important part of the lives of many people who live here in Northern Ireland. According to DECAL Sport NI figures, the, uh, sport contributes about 2.3% of the gross domestic product of the region, which is approximately £650 million pounds per annum. Um, beyond the physical benefits, of course, of regular participation in sport and physical activity, uh, sport has also been used to complement broader, what we might term, social development initiatives, uh, particularly within Greater Belfast. Now, these include programmes, of course, that use sport to assist in addressing educational underachievement, deviance, isolation, unemployment, and, of course, uh, mental health concerns, which we will focus on today. And uh, in a related development uh, to the role of sport in this regard, you'll be aware, of course, over the last 12 months of the work of the Belfast Strategic Partnership, um, which has made the promotion of so-called resilient communities here in Northern Ireland a core priority. In the main, uh, sporting initiatives of the uh, type we are discussing here and are aimed at uh, young people who are considered vulnerable, either in regard to their current circumstances or displaying symptoms that may indicate uh, the possibility of, uh, let's say, future socially undesirable uh, behaviour. Theories of uh, social vulnerability broadly refer to distorted relationships that uh, such young people have with institutes, institutions of society, such as uh, families, school, the employment market, healthcare, and the youth justice uh, system. Fundamental to this process is the progressive accumulation of uh, negative experiences with such institutions, which eventually give rise to social dis disconnectedness and with this, an unfavourable uh, future personal prognosis. All of these issues will presumably be central to DECAL's determination to make health and well-being a core priority under its promoting equality targeting social exclusion remit. So in the view of some, sports retain the potential to positively influence the culturally hard to measure factors that are often the root cause of young people's social vulnerabilities. These include how the enforcement of rules within a given sports setting influence processes of respect and conformity. Similarly, the manner in which questions of commitment and status on the part of vulnerable youth are mediated. Depending upon the nature of the sports activity on offer, the important role of the coach or the sports leader, in particular their own identity and their personal life story. And again, how this might influence affection and attachment outcomes. The impact of organisational context as a whole and its relationship with other key social institutions that exist. And finally, consideration of what might broadly be categorised as other background characteristics, for example, social class and levels of uh, disposable household income. Combined, seen together, all of these factors affect participants' response to any defined sports-led uh, intervention. So for many, Sport is seen as a social glue which serves to cohere, build and strengthen communities. But this proposition, which underpins broader arguments about sport's impact, has often remained untested. There exists instead a general belief in sport's potential for good, but a range of commentators remain sceptical of the blind faith that policymakers often display in this regard, again referring to the lack of evidence that exists displaying the causal link between sports participation and a raft of societal benefits thought to be associated with it. Thus, evidence for sports role in facilitating social outcomes of the types mentioned here is, for the most part, undermined by both conceptual and methodological weaknesses, and little or no considerations of the conditions from which they actually emerge. For example, a common feeling in this regard is the routine monitoring and evaluation of such programmes, which is often inappropriate, and thus its value in assessing the actual impact of such interventions upon those at whom it is targeted remains unclear. 
On balance, though, there are various reasons to be hopeful. First, the systematic and coherent use of sports has been shown to make an important, if measured, contribution to universal education, gender equality, poverty reduction, and the prevention of HIV AIDS. Second, sport embraces a wide variety of activities that can be tailored to the interests and abilities of people of all ages and that can take place locally and at a relatively low cost. Thirdly, is the growing body of evidence that sport is good for people who experience societal isolation and may in some cases be prone to mental health issues. An example of this initiative designed to address this very question was the finding by the Time to Change organisation via Comic Relief and DCMS of a programme in England developed in partnership with 16 professional football clubs that offered semi-structured football sessions as a means of developing conversations about life, related anxieties and concerns with young men. Critically, however, such sporting activities have to be constructed as a means to an end, not simply an end in themselves. As such, it is the nature, quality and salience of the sporting experience, or as Fred Coulter describes it, the developmental experience within the sporting experience that creates the conditions for social change. For all of the underlying scepticism and caution, however, in the main there appears to be an emerging credible body of literature reporting an association between organised youth sport and positive health-related educational and social outcomes. And this is particularly the case in relation to youth with lower capabilities for participation due to economic, cultural or social features. As sport, as view, as sport are seen rather as an opportunity to engage such vulnerable young people in a leisure context, not only in terms of participation in sport, but also across a range of related activities. For example, in a recent British cohort study, Feinstead et al. found that for vulnerable groups, sport club attendance at the age of 16 years reduced the chances of social exclusion outcomes by the time those young people reached the age of 30. Thus, it's argued that wider benefits accruing from organised sports participation are stronger for disadvantaged youth with social and academic de deficits and families residing in high-risk neighbourhoods. Ultimately, therefore, it might be timely to consider if socially vulnerable or disadvantaged youth somehow become less vulnerable or disadvantaged by partaking in certain sporting initiatives. In this regard, Bailey suggests it is reasonable to assume that certain principles and conditions need to be fulfilled for sports to generate any such desired social <coughs> outcomes. Coulter argues that outcomes will equally be determined by the frequency and intensity of participation and the degree of participants' adherence over a prolonged period of time. Practitioners who work with socially vulnerable youth in a sport context may not, however, possess concrete principles that they can systematically integrate into their activities and program designs. On, it is, on this very theme, it is clear that if sports-based practices are to contribute to broader social outcomes for socially vulnerable groups, then there is a clear need for education and training of those who design and deliver such interventions. When all of this is considered and aggregated, Coulter and Taylor conclude that sport programs which adopt a street-based or youth worker approach that are more person-centered than sport-centered and more youth work orientated than sports coach driven are potentially more effective when moving towards broader social outcomes, such as addressing isolation and educational underachievement. According to the authors, such programs allow people uh, allow more in-depth, intensive and extensive social relationships to form. In seeking to bridge the dual role of the sports coach youth worker, it has even been suggested that it would be easier and more effective for youth workers to learn sports skills than it would for <coughs> sports coaches to learn the skills of a youth worker. On this theme, when examining a range of UK and US-based sport inclusion programmes for youth, Ken Green from the University of Chester arrived at the conclusion that the most effective programmes are in fact those that are markedly different from traditional sports interventions, for example alternative or lifestyle sports and pursuits. 
In relation to young people in vulnerable situations, it is suggested that certain adolescents reject organized, competitive, mainstream sports because these environments contain components similar to those that they have already failed to adequately negotiate. For example, adherence to formal rules, achievement of externally defined goals, and testing situations. As an illustration of some of these principles that work closer to home, a focus on the Sport Changes Life Foundation, which works closely with the University of Ulster, is useful. This organization works with young people experiencing high levels of deprivation, educational achievement, uh, education underachievement, and youth disorder. The foundation uses sport as a catalyst for inspiration and change. Its flagship program, eHoops, is, is an intervention for young people not in or struggling with education, employment, or training. eHoops provides a six-month program of sport and education at the Jordanstown campus, plus ongoing one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentoring. This program exists in partnership with the PSNI, University of Ulster, and community workers. Sport Changes Life has received generous funding from the Department of Justice, Dell, and other agencies for its work, and has a base in Newton Abbey, Mersey Street, and Andersonstown. Similarly, the university's Sports Outreach Unit works with Sport Changes Life on the Youth Engagement Through Sport, or YES, program. This program aims to introduce young people of school-going age, young males from disadvantaged or underrepresented communities to the concept of higher education. This is particularly important, of course, in light of the findings of a report published in 2011 entitled Educational Disadvantage in Working Class Protestant Communities that indicated, and some of you might be aware, that only one in 10 young Protestants aspire to go to universities uh, here in Northern Ireland compared to one in five of Catholics of school leaving age. But as I say, the particular focus of the presentation today is around sports role in addressing mental health, or at least prioritize these, uh, what appear to be growing concerns around mental health and well-being of young people. And this is work that uh, Dr. Lynette Hughes from Neve has been involved in, spoken quite widely on, and uh, on that note, I'll hand over to Lynette to say more about that, that work now. Mm -hmm. Thank you.